Well, let me ask a question. Raise your hand if you recognize that graphic. Do you know what that is? That's the 100% emoji, right? How many of you guys text message in here? And if you use an iPhone or, heaven forbid, an Android phone, and you're on the dark side, you've probably seen an icon like that in your texting app. It's actually one of the top 10 used emojis, which is a graphic for all of those that don't know what emojis is. It's kind of like a fun picture way in text to send a message. It's one of the top 10 ways that people communicate when they use emojis. And usually when someone uses the 100% symbol, it's because they're saying, hey, I agree, or yes, I'm all in for that. You got it or I approve, or I'm cheering you on. The 100% emoji can mean a variety of things, but usually it's a positive thing and you are for it. But let's ask the question, where did the 100% graphic originate from? Like, what does it even represent? Well, for some of you who were great at school, both in elementary school or junior high or even high school, you know exactly where that 100% came from. On your test results, right? When you pass the test perfectly, they would write 100% at the top and underline it. Now, I didn't get good at education until I was in my doctoral program or in my master's program. Uh, In high school and middle school, I wish I was paying attention, but my body was present in the classroom, but my mind was somewhere else. Like Chris has left the building, even though he's physically present in the room. And I could tell you there was times where the teacher would say, okay, class, put away all your things. Time to take the test. And I would look around the room and say, what test? I didn't know there was going to be a test. And the teacher would say, Chris, the test that we've been talking about for two weeks now, right? And that's why I've named today's sermon, What Test? Because many of us don't realize that we take a test each and every month. It's a wisdom test. It's a who you're going to honor test, and it happens each and every month. And the test results that you have, regardless if you know you're taking this, will impact a lot of things in your life. Like, it will impact your stress that you have in your life. Maybe your anxiety goes up because of your test results you get from this test that we get to take every month. Maybe your marriage has conflict because of the test results that you're getting each month. Your kids feel this. And this test has the power to impact how much peace you feel each month. And here's the test that we all take each and every month. Every time you get paid, you get to take a test. Now, I usually phrase this in a few different ways as I teach this message. And sometimes I say, every time you get paid, you get to practice wisdom. And I do believe that. But I do think there is a level of where what would the percentage look like if we were being graded on how our finances look? Like if you were to give yourself a grade, what does it look like in your life when it comes to debt? How do you handle debt? Would you get 100% or would it be lower? What would be your grade on how much margin you have in your finances? Would you get 100% plenty of margin or would it be a lower score? What about saving for the future or the rainy day fund or making sure one day you can retire with dignity? You know, that means not hoping that Uncle Sam will come through with SSI, Social Security, because we all know that that's not going to be a big paycheck, right? And so how are you saving for your future? What would that look like? What kind of grade would you give yourself when it comes to that category? How about when it comes to you living generous? What would your life look like in generosity? What would be your grade that you would give yourself for how generous you choose to be with your finances? Now, is there anyone who feels like, man, I'm acing it. I'm getting 100% on all of those categories. No, right? Many of us feel like we could do better, and that's okay. 
I want us to be aware. It's like going to the gym. Sure, we can always tone up more. We can always lose more. The goal is that we are taking steps of progress. And God has a whole lot to say in Scripture about handling finances. And so today we are kicking off a new series called 100%. 100%. And overall, we're going to hope to be able to teach you things that if you choose to live it out, it will impact the wisdom that you get to practice each and every time that you get paid. Now, anytime I talk about money in church, people can get a little weird, and I totally get that. People can get a little uncomfortable, and it's kind of funny. I'll run into people after service, and they'll say, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, you shouldn't be talking about money at church. You shouldn't talk about that. Like, Keep that aside. Money and church and God, no, let people be generous. It's none of your business. What we do with our finances, don't talk about it at all. And that's kind of a funny place to come from. Because when you look at the life of Jesus and you look at the teachings of Jesus that are found in Scripture, did you know that he talks about that the most outside of the kingdom of God? So Jesus talks about finances and money and how it impacts your life big time in the New Testament. And I've come to the conclusion, you can disagree with me or not, but if you ever go and be part of a church and consistently are attending and they never talk about money, my opinion, you're at an unbiblical church. Because if Jesus talked about this so much, don't you think we should reference it from time to time? Also, it's kind of funny because guess what happens when you start to have a big crisis in your life? You start knocking on my door. Pastor Chris, I need to meet with you. Pastor Chris, I need to meet with you. And anytime someone's going through a crisis, majority of the time, it's one of two problems, sex or money. Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, my marriage is going through the ringer. We're having problems in my marriage. I need to meet with you right now, sex or money. It's always what it comes down to. Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, I really blew it at work. I think I'm going to get fired, or I was fired. Sex or money? Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, my teenage son needs help. Sex or money? Well, sex. It's a teenage son, right? (laughs) He doesn't have money yet. But before we get started in today's message, here's what I want you to know. The theme of today's talk is not to pick you up and shake you upside down to try to extort money out of you in the name of Jesus. That's not my goal at all. Actually, I want nothing from you. I don't want anything from you. I just want God's best for you. And I have experienced what God can do when you choose to live biblical finances out in your life. And it's a game changer. It changes everything. And so let me share a little bit about my life and my upbringing and some of the things that I have struggled with when it comes to money. You see, I grew up in a household where my mom and dad fought like cats and dogs until the day they divorced. And the theme of their fights always started around money. Tensions were running high because of money. Sure, it was like a tornado or a hurricane. You have a hurricane and you have all these spin-off tornadoes, right? Sure, it started around money and then everything else would come out of the closet with all the skeletons and all the anger, but it always started The ruckus started on the topic of money. After my parents split up, my mom and I went to go live with my grandparents. And guess what I found out living with grandma and grandpa? The problem existed in their household too. There was never enough money. And there was always a tension when it came to money. And guess what would happen? Arguments about money. And just like that hurricane that has spin-off tornadoes, The same thing happened in that household. Skeletons start getting dragged out of the closet. And before you know it, people aren't talking to each other. People are severing relationships in the family. I would witness this happen with my uncle and my aunts. They would have the same problem. I'd look at my cousin's life, and they would have the same problem. And I'd look at my sister and I as we grew up and became adults, and we would have the same problem. Finances would create a tension in the home over and over. So... I became 18 years old. I was going to college to get my bachelor's degree at the time, and I thought, now's the time to move out. I've got to get out of this toxic environment where everyone's always arguing about money and beyond. 
I loved them. I just couldn't live there anymore with them. And so I moved out on my own. The problem is I had no role model when it came to finances. I had no clue how to handle money. Now, I said I was in college, right? And so what do college students have access to? Professors, right? Because they're the educated ones. They're supposed to know everything about life and to be able to steer you right in life. And so I would go to my professors and be like, Professor, what class do I need to take? What economics course should I take to learn how to handle finances, not just to be able to budget, but to be able to build wealth? You know, because they're the educated elite, and they look down on the non-educated people who are not experts. What I learned is the reason there were professors at the college that I went to is because they're broke, right? They don't know what they're doing. Like, sure, they might be experts, and that was a media design degree, so they were really smart in creative advertising and media technology. They were great at that stuff, but they knew nothing. Look at their stock portfolio. They weren't driving Mercedes. They didn't live in paid-off homes. They didn't have extravagant amounts of wealth. Why am I learning from broke jokers? And unfortunately, I was too young to think that way. I just listened to them because they're the ones with the title. So I had to feel it from them, and it's like, okay, Their wisdom is not working in my favor. I know we'll go to the bank because on television, the bankers are always the wise people who can tell you how to handle your finances. And if you're a banker in the room, I don't mean to offend you, but here's the truth that I found out from bankers. Bankers are in the business of getting your money from you, right? And if you don't believe me, hear me on this. Go to any local branch and try to have a conversation with anyone randomly in the office. I get it. There might be one person who knows about mutual funds and stocks in the room. Talk to the rest. Why doesn't everybody know this in the room? If that's the way to build wealth, how come they all don't know it? But they all know how to get you signed up for credit cards and loans and interest payments. They all know how to give interest as a penalty, not a reward. And so really quickly, I was listening to the bank thinking they're the ones with wisdom. No go. Before I knew it, I had fallen into the trap that the rest of America has fallen into by listening to media, by listening to the bankers, by listening to college professors. I believed all types of ridiculous finance information, and it wasn't healthy for me. I was in debt so bad. I said this the other day at our financial class. I remember going through Taco Bell, ordering two soft tacos on a Diet Coke, right? And at that time, 20 years ago, here's my age, coming out, (laughs) that was like under five bucks, which seems about right. Now it's like 10 bucks when you do that. It's ridiculous. Anyways, that was like three bucks worth of food. And yet I didn't have enough cash in my account and didn't know it. And what happened? It cleared, but they charged me an overdraft fee. That means they charged me $35 on top of the cost of those tacos. That's the most expensive Taco Bell that I've ever ordered in my life, right? Fast forward time. I'm married to Stephanie. I'm starting to feel the tension when we talk about money in the household. We weren't fighting yet, but it was uncomfortable. And my wife, she's a night owl, so she's the kind of person who will, like, wake up at 11 a.m., So one day I woke up and it hit me, red alarm, red alert, like "Eh, eh, eh, eh." we're headed into a zone that the rest of my family legacy has been in, arguing about money. And so I got up and I prayed that morning and I had zero answers to what we can do. And I waited for my wife to wake up. And around 11 a.m. she woke up when it's just about time for us to start figuring out what's for lunch. (laughs) She got up and when she came out to the living room, I just had a heart to heart with her. I shared my concern. Honey, I'm worried. Here's the legacy, the family problems that I've had in my life, where my family fought like cats and dogs. There was never enough money in my household. What can we do? We're in debt. You've got debt. I've got debt. We only have so many, as we would say, pesos in the bank account, so many dollars there. We lived in San Diego at the time, so we were near Mexico. That's why we said it that way. Um, And so I said, what should we do? Single men in the room, get yourself a godly wife. Because this is what she did. She pulled out the Bible and she said, God has all the answers that we could ever ask. And then she started telling me all about a class that she took at one point called Financial Peace University. 
And it was a class where she learned how to handle money God's way. Biblical principles for finances. Now, we're going to give you a sneak peek over the next three weeks about what you could learn from Financial Peace University. And if you related with anything I just shared, we started Financial Peace yesterday. It's not too late to get in it. We have our second installment coming at 10 a.m. on Saturday. If you want in on it, Ricky's over there. There, Don't worry, he's not wearing a pink shirt. That is salmon. That is a salmon shirt, right, Ricky? Ricky's over there. He's leading the class. He would love for you to join us. And here's what we'll do. If you go to it for the first time this week, we will play the first week after the second week so you can get caught up. And we'll get you all the information that you need. So my wife and I started to handle money God's way using biblical principles. And I could tell you this, and this is a thing that we could claim that many of you cannot claim. My wife and I have not had one argument over finances in nine years. When's the last time you argued with your spouse about finances? This is the kind of power that we're talking about. When we unlock God's wisdom for our life and we start to live it out, it makes a huge difference in what God is doing in our life. Now, I get this. For some of you, this is an adjustment that you have to have. And it's going to be hard for you to listen to this because you've been taught all of your life the same wisdom that the world taught me and robbed me of my money. You've been taught credit cards are a thing for an emergency. Really? Really? An emergency? Why? So you can make it a full blowing crisis? <laughs> like, what, what's going to happen when the credit card runs out and you have to make a payment? Credit cards are not there for a rainy day. <laughs> it's just bad logic. And so some of you are going to disagree with me at times, and that's okay. But here's what I want. I want you to evaluate because some people get mad and they're like, like, like last year I taught on a very similar sermon to this and we had someone leave the church and I said, hey, why aren't you coming back? I don't agree with your view on handling finances. I'm like, so we can't agree to disagree? I mean, like we have to see eye to eye on every topic? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate if you're uncomfortable and you're having knee-jerk reactions to want to leave, not come back, to disagree, to be angry with me. Ask yourself who you're aligning with. Are you aligning with what Jesus wants for your life? Or are you aligning with what the enemy of your soul wants for your life? Because the enemy of your soul wants to use any excuse possible that gets you worked up to want to never come back. The enemy of your soul wants to get you so worked up that you never ever fund the mission of Jesus. The enemy of your soul doesn't want you to live in obedience to Christ. In fact, the enemy of your soul wants the arguments in your family to continue forward. And he is a master at convincing us that this is our idea. This is my free will and what I want. And he's tricking us. He's just figured out what kind of candy wrapper he needs to put over destruction to make you take a bite and to jump in and get involved with his horrible logic. And so sometimes we could struggle with this. And so I want to encourage you just for a moment, for the next three weeks, Instead of getting grumpy, just say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to see what Jesus has to offer when it comes to biblical wisdom, when it comes to finances. Now, you're going to probably disagree with this sermon the most out of all three sermons. And so congratulations, you're making it through the most uncomfortable of the three sermons today. We've got it out of the way because today we're talking about giving and living generous with God. Next week, we talk about spending. And the week after that, we talk about saving. Those two are great sermons that have nothing to do with giving towards God. But here, real quick, I want to share some logic when it comes to the world. You see, what the world will teach you is that you, let me make sure these are facing you, should live life like this. Ah, I messed it up already. There we go. All right, the world says to do this. Hey, when you get paid, what you do first is you spend, spend, spend. Use that money that's coming into that bank and go live your life. YOLO, you only live once. FOMO, fear of missing out. Do not miss out. Or as my mom would say, like I said earlier, get while the getting's good. Spend the money while it's there. And we spend, 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 spend. And this includes your debit and your credit. 
when you're spending. Because we all know sometimes it's not our fault, but sometimes that paycheck just doesn't last to the end of the month. It must be those weird months that go to the 31st. You know, those extra days in the month, it's their fault that my paycheck did not last that much. And society would say, while you spend, if for some reason you had a windfall of money and you weren't able to spend it all, or for some reason that month you just had a little bit of extra, then you save and you put it into your savings account. And then by all means, if after you feel good about how much you put in your savings account, if after that you have a little bit left and you want to give to uh, someone who's in a time of need or to a good cause or to your local church, then go ahead and do that. But the biblical way of looking at your finances is the complete opposite. It's inverted approach. The Bible says that we should do this. The Bible teaches us we should give first, save second, then live on the rest. Key words, live on the rest. Not spend 100% down here so you're in debt, but live on the rest. And if this is news to you, I promise you this. If you do this for one year, you will have more money in your bank account at the end of the year. Why? Well, I do believe that God blesses you when you give to him, but let's just say that wasn't the case. You'll have more money at the end of the year because you're specifically earmarking money and putting it aside. You're specifically living on a plan to spend less than you make and put money into the bank account. And as long as you don't draw money out of that savings account, you'll have more money at the end of the year. Now, here's the bigger problem because that is just wisdom. Here's the bigger problem when we look at society's way of handling money. Let's look at the theological problem with it. Outside of the Bible tells you to do this, so we should do this in obedience. Here's the bigger problem when we spend first. Me, me, God. See how that works there? First me, second me, last God. I've been in the church for a while now. I've been a pastor for a while now. I've studied it in both my master's and my doctorate. And I've learned any time, this is simple logic when it comes to theology, any time we put God last in an area of our life, God will not be able to fully bless that area of our life. We're pushing God out. We're refusing to listen to his wisdom. We're refusing to listen to his logic. We're not allowing him into the situation. We're saying, hey, God, we know you got blessings for us, but I don't want them. I want to live my way. You know, the plans that the enemy of my soul has, this is one of his plans, and I want to live that. I don't want to live your plans, God. And so why don't you just, like, check it at the door when it comes to finances? And that leads me to my next fill-in-the-blank for you on your outline. Until you prioritize giving as your first priority, God will never be able to fully bless your finances. And it's not that God's mad at you so he's pulling back the blessings. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. Sure, he's seeking you. He wants to have a relationship with you. But he allows you to have the free will of if you're going to engage in him. If you're going to choose to walk by faith. If you're going to grow in your faith. If you're going to try to live for him in all the areas of your life. And so... Here's, that's why we've called this what test, because many of us didn't realize that we are taking a test each and every week, and we didn't realize if we are passing that test, failing that test, or what percent that we are getting on this test. Now, many of us have chosen to put something else as the first priority in our life, visa. When you get paid, you pay the visa bill. Or some of us have put Walmart as the first priority in our life. Or Amazon as the first priority in our life. Now don't get me wrong, I love Amazon. Like it's got everything that I can't find in person, I just jump on Amazon. I need a special light for the auditorium that I can't find in person, Amazon's got it. I need tablecloths that are certain sizes and certain colors, Amazon's got it. Like it is great. But that doesn't mean I should put Amazon as my first priority in life. Walmart's awesome. It's got a gang of stuff. In fact, your Walmarts are like on steroids out here. 
in California, they're not as big. They're not as like stocked. They don't have as much variety as your Walmarts here. Walmarts here are super Walmarts. They're just so common in that way. They took the super off it because it's just Walmart here. It's got a gang of stuff. It's huge and it's awesome. But let me ask you this. Does Visa or Amazon or Walmart, do they have the possibility of blessing your finances? No. Only God has the power to bless your finances. And yet we choose to not make him a priority in our life. And so there's this principle in scripture, and it's called the tithe. And the tithe is a scriptural word that translates to 10%. And the Bible talks about it in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And I get it. Some of us in the room are like, "Woo! wait a minute. Are you talking about giving 10% of my income back to the church? You're crazy. I was with you up until you got to that point. Now, I, I, like, you don't understand, Pastor Chris. Even if I wanted to, I don't have the margin to be able to give 10% back to God. First, I would encourage you to go to Financial Peace University because it will teach you how to pay off debt and have margin because I want you to have margin to do 10% with whatever you want to do with it. I want you to have that kind of margin. But second, we also have something in our church that we call the giving ladder. And here's what the giving ladder is. You go from a nothing to a something. The goal is, hey, I don't give anything, but I'm going to start to grow in generosity and learn how to give and strengthen my giving muscle And so I'm going to figure out whatever that is that I can start giving today and start working at that and do it consistently, going from a nothing to a something. And then we go from a something to a tithe. And so the goal is each month as you get better and better at handling your finances and telling your dollars where you want it to go, you could turn it up a little bit. And eventually you get to a place where you start to give 10%. And then... The next step on the giving ladder is to go from a tithe to an offering. An offering is when we go above and beyond the 10%. And I know what you're thinking, Pastor Chris, that is stupid. Why would anyone give above 10%? If God says the law is 10%, why go above it? Because I've hit the marker at 10%. Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because God blesses the giver. We're going to talk about this here in a moment. Actually, let's just jump into it now. There are three principles to live by when it comes to tithing. Number one in your notes, tithing is the only place in Scripture where we are invited to test God. Many people are like, hey, God, if you're real, show me a sign. Technically, theologically, you shouldn't do that. The only place that we're to seek God, if he's actually going to be real, if he's actually going to come through, that Scripture has invited us into, is to do it through giving. And that's starting at the tithe, which again is 10%. Now, Malachi chapter 3 has these words. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Circle test me in this on your outline. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. In Scripture, the storehouse is translated to the local church. And Jesus and God is saying, hey, test me in this. Go ahead, give it a try. Go for a season. See if you will not be blessed. You see, I believe firmly that you can't outgive God. You just can't. He's the most generous being to ever exist. And now, I'm not saying because you gave 100 bucks today or you gave your 10% today, you're going to have a windfall of money next week. That is not what I'm saying. I mean, you might, but that's not what I'm saying. But there's other ways God can bless you. I think one of the blessings that we are blessed with is that the relationship, when you start handling money God's way, your marriage has a lot more peace in it. That seems like a blessing, a lot less arguments about money. Here's one that I have in my life. My wife and I have cars, and they are older. We drive cars probably at the same age as your teenagers, and they've got a ton of miles on them. In fact, my wife's minivan, every time we bring it to the shop to get fixed up or the oil change, the mechanic is like, whoa, this thing's still alive? This thing's still running? This is actually not a Volkswagen. This is a Chrysler. 
with Volkswagen badges on it, and it should not be running with this many miles on it. Now, I believe that's God's blessing. He's helping the car to continue to last all these years. I'm not saying it's going to last forever, but he's blessed us financially to help stretch the life of that car. About a year ago, I bought a house here in North Mobile, and I had zero lawn equipment when I moved to the area. If you know where my house is, you're saying, what lawn? And that's a topic for another day, okay? And I needed a lawnmower because there is a little patch of grass in my backyard that grows like weeds if we don't cut it in the summertime. And now I was eyeballing a lawnmower at Lowe's. And it was about 400 bucks for a decent lawnmower, 300 on the, the junky end, you know, and I'm talking push because I can't afford what you, you guys have, those sitting down tractor lawnmowers. I don't understand you spend five grand on a lawnmower. That, that's just, whew, that's too much for me. So I'll go old school and just push a lawnmower, right? And I went across the street to introduce myself to the neighbor. And the neighbor happens to be in the business of buying wholesale from Home Depot and Lowe's. And he had a brand new lawnmower sitting in the box. He sold me the same unit that I was looking at, at Lowe's for 100 bucks. That was 450 bucks at Lowe's. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think that's how God blesses and supernaturally stretches your dollar. You see, what I've learned over the years when I came to following God, on many levels I've learned all kinds of lessons, but when it comes to giving, here's what I've learned. When I give my 10% to God and I partner with God on handling the rest of the 90%, he can go further than I can go with 100% alone. God supernaturally multiplies the dollars and blesses me for choosing obedience in him. Now, I think part of this is a career blessing. I think that I've had opportunities in my career to get ahead and success in my career where the like, ministry just seems to flourish. Yes, I'm doing my work. Yes, God is showing up and doing miracles. But I also think there's a link to generosity in there, to giving and being obedient with Jesus and choosing to pay it forward. And God blesses me as a result in that area. Just the other day, I heard about a family in our church, huge promotion, and they're moving away. And it breaks my heart. I mean, they are like salt of the earth people. That promotion didn't come from anywhere. I believe it was a blessing that you can't outgive God. And so, number one, like I said, the tithe is the only place so we're invited to test God. I'll talk about that when we get to the close of the message. Number two, you can't give a tithe. You can only bring it. You can't give a tithe. You can only bring it. Remember a moment ago when we had the giving ladder and we went from a nothing to a something, from a something to a tithe? Once you get to the tithe level of giving, now you're hitting the marker of obedience. Anything beyond the tithe is where generosity starts. And again, God invites us. He asks us, test me. See if you can, I'll give me. And that's why people give offerings, because they know God will respond and bless. We'll talk about how God blesses in a moment. But you can't bring a tithe because the tithe already belongs to God. Now, this is another area where people kind of get frustrated when we start talking about 10% and giving and the tithe belonging to God. People get frustrated because they're like, Chris, I get it. When I look at my children, I understand they are a blessing from God. And for some of you, you look at your spouse and hopefully you're saying they are a blessing from God. Thank you for them. You look at your friendships in life, some of your best friends that you love to be around, and you're like, they are a blessing from God. And it's easy for us to look at people and think, God brought these people into my life. God gave me this child, like those parents on the stage. God gave you that child. And it's easy for us to see that. But when it comes to our finances, we're like, wait a minute. God didn't give me this money. I had to work for this money. Those are hard-earned dollars. Well, last week, we talked all about how there's three parts, my part, God's part, their part, right? And we talked about how our church has lived open-handed, where we funded programs that we didn't have before. We opened the keys to our facility and let people do sports and life here on property. We chose to serve in ministry teams. And what happened? We had 50 people who let us know that they came to faith. We had 17 people get baptized. As of last week, we had 39 people who had joined our church as members. It's bigger today. I'll share about that in a moment. Like God is doing good things in our church. 
right? Because we did our part and God did his part and other people did their part. Well, when it comes to your job, there's a my part and a God's part. Yeah, if you want to have money, you got to go to work, right? You got to earn the income. But what makes you think God didn't give you that job? What makes you think God didn't give you that skill set? Sure, you had to go to school or training or get certified or intern or learn it. You had to do your part to learn it. But what makes you think that God didn't give you the cognitive ability to gain the information and the ability to apply the information to your efforts? God was all up in it. And sure, you had to do your part and earn the job, but your part doesn't just go in and getting the job and working the job. Your part's also bringing back the tithe. Check out what Leviticus chapter 27 says. A tithe of everything from the Lord, whether a grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So let me ask you a question. What do you call something that you hold on to that doesn't belong to you? Stealing, right? Scripture's quite clear that when we choose not to grow in generosity and choose not to learn how to tithe as Christ followers, we are choosing to rob God. And I don't mean for that to be harsh, but there is a harsh reality when the church people refuse to be obedient in this area. And here's what the reality is. You are robbing not just blessings from your life and your family's life that God wants to do, you're robbing other people of blessings as well. Think about it. If no one funded the mission of Wilson Avenue this last five months, how would we have 50 people saved? How would we have 17 people baptized? How would we have all those new members? How would the attendance have gone from 200 to 300 on average in our church? It wouldn't. You who gave to our church blessed other people by funding the mission of Jesus Christ, and we were able to push back darkness as a result. We say it all the time around here. The church is God's plan A for the world. We are the hope for the world, and there is no plan B. And so when you choose not to give to the church, guess what you're doing? You're letting darkness conquer just a little bit more of the neighborhood because the efforts in the mission of Jesus cannot prevail as far because we're not funding the mission of God. We're not putting people in places. We're not starting new ministries. We started a re-engage ministry, which is a marriage enrichment program. It costs money to run those programs. And that I'm not trying to complain. I'm just saying the truth. It costs money, and yet marriages are being restored because we funded that program. We have plans this fall to start our 12-step Christ-centered recovery right here in our church. We have plans this fall to have the gymnasium open so your kids can play in a big space during church. We are going to open it up for the, the elementary side aged kids because we're running out of space in the peak season in this facility and we need to make more space for more people. It's funding the mission of Jesus. You know, I have some friends in California. Before I moved here to Alabama, I lived in San Diego, California. It's a beautiful place. If you ever get a chance, I want to encourage you, go on a trip there. You won't regret it. But my friend Ben and Joy, I got to watch God move in their life. And when they first started coming to church, they were like many of us, in debt, didn't have margin, didn't know how to handle finances, were trying to grow in their relationship with God, struggled with the teachings of Scripture, didn't know what to think, but I don't want you to hear it from me about what God did in their finances. I want you to hear it from Ben and Joy. I'm active duty Navy, and uh, she's from the Philippines. So when she went over here to marry me, uh, I was in debt. Before she came over here, my spending habits were typical of a, a sailor. I got my first credit card when I was 19 over in Japan and then just put everything on that. And it built on, built on. And then once I moved to the U.S. back in 2010, I got a car and that added on to my debt. We needed a new bed when she moved here, put that in the credit card, and just everything just kept piling up. So it's just uh, one thing after another, uh, my paycheck was going to the banks and that was it. I haven't been to church for 15 years. My, my family stopped going after my dad passed away. Uh, and then we saw a billboard for Eastlake Church when we went to go see a movie in Otay Ranch. And uh, I asked her as a favor, I said, do you want to go to this church as a favor to her. And then sure enough, the first message, uh, I was hooked. We've been going here 
since 2015 and we haven't stopped since. During that time we had to figure out on how we're going to do this. We can't live like this any longer. As I'm used to uh, spending and then saving and then give whatever we could. And then sure enough, that week was uh, FPU. Financial Peace University was offered through Eastlake and we had to go. So after we attended Financial Peace, every credit card that we paid off felt like a blessing. Like Pastor Chris said, every paycheck that you get is a chance to practice wisdom. And for us, every paycheck that we get is a chance to uh, share God's blessing. And we weren't able to do that until we were done with our debt. It's not an overnight thing where you just pay everything off. It's, it's a weekly commitment. It's a daily commitment to each other. On May 30, 2019, we celebrate um, debt free. It took five years of hard work and uh, a lot of fights. We do budgeting and, and everything. A lot of budgeting too, that's in there. For me, it's just when you're not worried about money, it leaves you a lot more room to praise God. For me, giving is how are you spending your blessings for God's purpose? Saving is how are you taking care of God's people, which is you and your spouse or your children, all that. And then spending is I made you, go enjoy it. So it's really hard to not do the spending part, but what happens is that too many people spend to enjoy life. They forget about God's purpose and God's gift, which is life. We support a missionary in the Philippines for uh, indigenous people. We were able to send life straw out to the people that didn't have clean water out there mm -hmm. until they can get the proper uh, water tanks and all that. But at first it was super scary. I'm not used to it. Uh, 10 years, 12 years of my Navy career, I was in debt. I always had somebody to pay. And now everything that comes in, I'm able to share. And that fear of what is this money for is gone because we are able to trust uh, in Jesus fully. And every time we share the feelings that um, this, uh, this money is not for us, this money is from God and to God. So contentment is really for us brought forward by us helping people in need. So I guess by pushing God's mission we're able to spend less time thinking about the worldly things and yeah. we're able to just go ahead and be happy with what God gave us. Yeah, we can give them a round of applause. Anytime we have a story of God changing someone's life, of course we should celebrate that. Again, today's message is not about trying to get money from you. It's about choosing to put God first in your life and trusting that he will provide. Now, some of you are like, man, I chose a terrible day to bring my friend to the church. Pastor Chris is talking about giving. They're going to hate it here. And I totally get that. And I want you to know, we don't talk about this in each and every sermon. We actually talk about a lot of stuff and the way we present the information, the gospel of Jesus and what Jesus teaches through scriptures and what the rest of the scriptures teach. We teach it in tangible ways. And our hope is that you're able to take this information and start living it in your life on Monday. If you can't do it on Monday, we won't say it on Sunday. But if you're not a Christ follower in the room, we understand your position because you aren't called to put God first in your finances. But those of us that have decided to take the step of water baptism and have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, I have to ask you the question, what's holding you back from putting God first in your life? Why the hesitation of following God? The third message point that I want to point out today is this, tithing is giving God my first and my best. And over the years of being a pastor, I could just tell you I've met people who are blessed and I've met people who are broke and burdened. And I've met people who have been tithers and not tithers. And you could guess which one is who. Now, a moment ago, I said that God wants us to test them when it comes to finances. You know, it's not wrong to do this. It's not just for the, the first-time givers. Any time in your walk with Jesus, God has this open-door policy, like, come on, baby, let's do this. See if you can out-give me. See if I won't shower blessings down upon you. 
And so I want to challenge you today, in your program, I forgot to get a program, but in your program on the connection card, there's a box on there that talks about the tithe challenge, a 90-day challenge. And if this stuff has been resonating with you today, and you're interested in seeing what God could do, I want to encourage you to sign up for the tithe challenge, and we'll be sending you videos and emails to help you for the next 90 days. First, to talk about how to start. Second, to start giving you verses and devotionals to help you on this journey as you partner with God and watch him radically change your life and bless other people through your efforts. And here's the thing. After 90 days, after three months, if you don't feel that God has blessed you, you could schedule an appointment with me, sit me down, I will stay quiet, and you could tell me all about how I was foolish and wrong and you were right. And I've always offered that when I do a 90-day challenge. And I've spoken this 90-day challenge in front of 5,000 people before. Not all at once. It was like five services of 1,000 people. But do you know how many people that 5,000 sat me down after 90 days? Zero. Why? Because you can't outgive God. Now, here's the thing I want you to know. We never give to get. That's prosperity gospel, and it makes me sick. Okay? Here's how I think it works. God is looking for his men and women to be faithful and obedient. And when he looks down from heaven, he's got all kinds of blessings stored up. I mean, Scripture tells us he wants to open the floodgates, send blessings down, and change the world. And so I believe God's looking down, and he's saying, man, where are my faithful people? Who can I trust with this resource? And then he sees someone who's been diligently giving, season in, season out. And he goes, ah, there he is, John Doe, Jane Doe. I could trust them. I could trust them with this resource. And he sends it down. But again, it's never just for us to get. I believe God gives us this resource because he knows exactly what we'll do with that resource. And he knows that resource will go back out into society to change the world. Here's how a practical thing happened to me that's just like that. A few years back, I was driving my car home from work. It was late, about 8 or 9 p.m., and a car T-boned me through the intersection. And now, my car was kind of a bucket, which is slang for a beater, which is slang for kind of a junk car, okay? So I didn't have full coverage on it, so I was going to have to wait for this other guy's insurance to cough up the money. And they were in no rush to write me a check for my car, Right? They wanted to do an investigation. I'm like, the guy was drunk, and he turned left into my car that I had the right away. Like, what more investigation? They're going to take four or five months anyways, right? And I had about $4,000 that I can move out of savings to go buy a little, you know, putt-putt to get to and from work. I wasn't trying to be rolling, just, you know, just a little beater to get to and from work. And so I was on Facebook, just offensively low-balling people, just rude the kind of thing that you would hit block and delete and like never talk to this human ever. Like how dare he offer me that kind of money. And I was getting frustrated because I couldn't find anything that was, I'm not saying decent, just like, you know, I, that will actually last for six months to get to him from work. And so as a joke and out of frustration, I messaged a guy who had a really nice truck and I said, hey, how about four grand? And he replied back, ha, put a two in front of that number and we've got a deal. Okay. And I was like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of joking, just a little frustrated, trying to find a, a, a car just to get to and from work. Have a great day. About 10 minutes later, I get a notification on my phone. I open it up. It's the guy I was messaging about the truck and says, hey, can I talk to you? Can I get your phone number? I'd love to call you. Now, that might sound weird to you guys, a stranger from the internet wants to call you, but my profile on Facebook and on Instagram is public because I'm a pastor. You know, I'm a public figure. I try to let people see my life and interact with me. So I'm thinking, he probably looked at my Facebook page and sees that I'm a pastor and wants to talk about God, sent him my number, hit sent, and assumed that I'll get a phone call. And I did. A few minutes later, my phone rang. I pick it up, and he's like, hey, it's me, Brock, from Facebook. Man, I was looking at your profile, and my wife and I were talking about it. And we don't know why. There's this, like, weird feeling we got. But we feel like God's telling us to give you this truck. Come and get it. And at first I was like, okay, who's punking me? You know, like what's going on here? And I told my wife, 
hey, this is what happened. I have offensively lowballed someone, and he kind of told me to get lost. And then he asked for my phone number, and he says we can have the truck for free. And my wife turns her head sideways and looks at me like there's got to be more to the story. So we get in the car, and we drive across the county to go meet this family. And when I get there, the truck is as good in real life as it looked like on the Internet. So immediately being that close to Mexico, I think, okay, drug mule time. Like, this thing is packed full of cocaine and heroin. Like, I'm going down, right? I'm walking around the car, kicking the tires, sniffing the door panels. The guy probably thought I was insane, right? It checked out. And the guy walked outside of his house with the keys and a title in hand signed over to me. We prayed together. We cried together. We hugged each other. What I found out was this was a young military couple that was moving away and they needed to pare down, and they were trying to get rid of the truck to pare down for their big move. And they felt God was calling them to give me that car. I turned on the car that day, and I started driving back to my house. Stephanie drove home in her own car because she had to drive me there, okay? So I'm alone in the car. You're going to think I'm, I'm lying. This is not a joke. This is not a lie. The turned on the radio, and I could tell you, a guy who lives authentically enough with a walk with Jesus to give his $24,000 truck away, which probably in today's market would be 34000 because everything's marked up, is walking with the Lord. When you've when you got that kind of a walk and you can give something away and live that open-handed, I'm going to turn on the radio. He had the Christian radio station on. And it's going to sound silly. It's going to sound ridiculous. But this, I don't even know the name of the song, but these are the lyrics. I love you more, then I'm going to botch the lyrics, than the stars in the sky, than the sun Right? You've heard that song? Bud, where am I at? What song is it? He doesn't know. We all can jam him up. He's the worship leader. He's paid to know that. <laughs> I'm not. I just got to talk for a while up here. Anyways, I love you more than the stars and the sun. And it's all a song about like God created the universe, but he loves us more. And you better believe as I drove home that day from that guy's house, I believed that. I thought, God has not forgotten about me. Now, a moment ago, I said we never give to get, right? And this sounds like a get story, doesn't it? Well, here's the deal. I used that truck to the best of my ability to honor God. Anytime someone needed something to be moved, my pickup's available. You want to take it? You want me to meet you there? Anytime the church needed something, I rolled my pickup. Sure, there was better trucks in the church, but I put let mine get up there as fast as possible because it's God's truck. He gave it to me. And then the time came when I saw someone else in need of a vehicle. And I had my God moment and knew, time to release this blessing that God gave me to bless someone else. And I don't even have to ask. I know that when they drove away, they had the same feeling that I felt when I drove away. God had not forgotten about them. God loves them. God provides. God does miracles. That's what I mean when you can't outgive God. And God over and over and over has blessed my wife and I, and we've lived like this. And there's been times where we shouldn't be able to make it, and yet we're able to make it. And so let me close with this last fill-in for you. When you bring your first and best, he promises to bless the rest. When you bring your first and best, he promises to bless the rest. Would you pray with me?